This wetland is designed to produce the highest quality of effluent possible in Australia. Very high tech sewage treatment plant. It's a membrane bioreactor. However, it is still not able to treat effluent to the level required for discharge in the Logan River and hence we've got the seven and a half hectares of wetlands here which do the final polishing process. There's no pathogens coming out of the plant because of the filtration capabilities of it. It actually filters out um, things like E. coli and other enterococci and phosphorus coming out of this plant is expected to be very low too but again the wetland is going to remove significant amounts of phosphorus nitrogen remaining solids any biological oxygen demand from the system and indeed the clarity of the water is testimony to the fact that the wetland system is working effectively we've got really low turbidity coming out of the wetlands that's accepted for drinking water quality a little bit of microbes will be generated in the wetland so it's and in fact that is one of the biological functions of a wetland is not to sterilize water and indeed the water coming from the MBR plant is essentially sterile but you don't actually want to put sterile water into a river and so the wetland essentially environmentally primes the effluent prior to discharge into the river any nutrients that do come out are in the form of organically bound nutrients as opposed to say nitrate, nitride or ammonium and that is a much safer form for rivers systems than if you put nitrate or nitride or ammonium into a system. Wetlands are very dynamic ecosystems so over time the plant communities are going to change dramatically and whilst they're in fairly neat bands at the moment over time you'll see those bands merging and different species finding their own niche some will establish more on the edges some will become dominant in the deeper bits some will become dominant in the shallow bits you don't really want to plant a monoculture with uh, this kind of wetland because there are so many micro environmental niches within a wetland system that different species are going to adapt to. And we planted eight different species in the wetlands and we also put in seeds of three other species and uh, some species went better than others, some were slower developers than others, and some were more palatable to birds and so we had early issues during those times. But all of the species that we planted uh, still remain in the wetland, so that's a very good sign. But ecosystems are very dynamic. All species that we chose have been well tested in a number of other wetlands. There are a couple of more experimental plant species. But one of the big successes of this particular wetland is that we used seeds for example Cyperus species and Juncus species and we dispersed seed around the wetland just before the plants were planted. That was really a, a saving grace because uh, they filled in a lot of the niches where there was poorer establishment during the drought conditions and in some cases the cedar plants have become the dominant species. The more biomass you've got, the more surface area that you've got that's exposed to the effluent that's flowing through, then the more surface area of biofilm you've got. And it's really the biofilm in these systems that are the grunt of the system that removes the contaminants. And the primary purpose of the biofilm in this system is to reduce nitrogen concentrations from around 3 milligrams per litre down to 1 milligram per litre. The Logan River is a very stressed river so it's already overloaded and you want to put in water that is of better quality than the existing river water and this is within a drinking water catchment so consequently there's consideration there for future extraction of potable water and of course you need very high quality water for that to happen. We look at all of the 
components that are required for discharge and that includes nitrogen forms, phosphorus forms, suspended solids, biological oxygen and demand. Also pH and dissolved oxygen and what we're finding is that in all cells except for the first cell our nitrogen levels are well below one milligram per litre and our discharge limit is three milligrams per litre. Uh, although our median discharge limit is one milligram per litre. So cells two and three are perfect, ready for receiving effluent. There's a little bit of residual nitrogen in 1B, which could possibly be some issues we had during the developmental stage where we had uh, weeds coming in and now they've been managed. There's still some decomposing vegetation, maybe disseminating a little bit of nutrient. there still will be some nutrients discharged into the river then trees are planted as a form of a compensatory arrangement for discharging effluent even though it's a very high quality so that was part of the agreement for allowing a sewage treatment plant to exist here in the first place even though we only planted Iliacaris in bands we're finding them throughout the whole span of the wetland so obviously their seeds are being carried around and then they're germinating in areas that they weren't planted. And we are finding that with a number of the different species now as well where we're finding that they've actually seeded and they're second generation plants. So that's part of the dynamic nature of uh, wetlands and really exciting to see that happening in this system. Juncus was a plant that we grew by seed and you can see it's actually the predominant plant in this band. So what happened is that the plants that were originally in this band didn't go very well for one reason or another, but the juncus um, filled in all the gaps. So, and in, in fact, this one, you can see the very high surface area of those stems. So I reckon that will be a brilliant constructed wetland species. This cell here had been a problem early on in the piece, uh, a lot of bird damage, but as you can see here, this junk has just saved the day, basically. This is pretty good for Logan. This is our first set of major wetlands and we're hoping to turn it into a showpiece. If any changes need to be done to how fast or how slow, we might have to slow the water flow down to enhance the product to the end. These are twisters and they're the outlet distribution pipes of the wetland and uh, they're adjustable uh, so you can, they're simply a uh, 90 degree bend on the outlet pipes and you can move them up or down to adjust the water flow. So sometimes for management purposes you want to drop the water level in the wetland for example uh, if you want uh, the if the plants need a bit of regeneration dropping the water level will make them travel send out rhizomes and new shoots rather than water just rushing through the system you want to hold it in the system the water level will increase a little bit and then drop back down Even though there's only about 300 mil head between that cell and this cell, it uh, distributes very evenly the water across the wetland. And that's really important. You want an even flow to be distributed in the wetland so that it doesn't uh, promote short circuiting. You want it, the effluent to be mixed all through that plant community as it flows through. As the water flows, it's exposed to lots of different micro environments. So it'll go from an aerobic zone to an anaerobic zone. It'll encounter different biofilm, different communities of microbes. And that diversity of environments is really a key to constructed wetlands. And that's why maintaining a flow through a wetland system is essential because each little molecule of water is exposed to so many different 
environments and uh, and the aerobic environments are going to promote aerobic um, decomposition. Um, the anaerobic environments are going to promote denitrification, which is a process where um, nitrogen is converted from ammonium to nitrates and nitrites and then into nitrogen gases, nitrous oxide, N2O and NO2. There's also a physical filtration component to wetlands. Um, because there's so many stems from these plants in the wetlands, each stem grows biofilm, that very diverse community of microorganisms. And as that water contacts the stems, the biofilm's a bit sticky, so you can imagine that a particle can stick to that biofilm. It'll then become incorporated into the biofilm matrix and then become part of the, the sediment of the system. So that's one of the reasons wetlands are so effective at removing suspended solids. And another component is biological oxygen demand, and that's uh, easily degradable organic compounds and as it's exposed to microbes, they use that as a food source. So they'll quickly grab that, those organic compounds, chew them up and, and get rid of them from the wastewater stream. And you normally put it in upside down. water here. Always give it a bit of a smell test, nice and sweet. Mm. So we got the water sample. So I'm going to measure pH and dissolved oxygen which is 7.26 milligrams per litre and that's great. Our discharge limits is 2 milligrams per litre and pH is 7.44 down there and we need to discharge between 6.5 and 8.5 and fairly low salinity that's excellent for irrigation so I'll just let that one stabilize and in the meantime I'll put a little turbidity tester here put into the, the turbidity meter push the button I'll have a little think about it There you go, 1.4 NTU. And just to give you a perspective on what that means, typically drinking water is around two milligrams or one, uh, two NTU or one NTU. So this really, this turbidity is good enough for drinking water. So it's stabilized at 7.12 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen and pH 7.32. That's absolutely spot on. It's got almost four times more oxygen than what is our discharge limit and pH is perfect. Algae can sometimes increase the oxygen and increase the pH. So the amount of algae immediately around the sampling point can influence it. But uh, algae will decrease over time as the plant canopy um, reaches 100% and there won't really be much algae in the system. The water chemistry is strongly influenced by the microenvironment that it goes through. So as it travels through the wetland, it's going to encounter many different microenvironments. Um, some areas are going to be aerobic, some areas will be anaerobic. There's going to be different kind of biofilm. The different plants themselves create a different substrate uh, and that's going to change the environment. So it's passing that wastewater through multiple environments as it travels its way down the wetlands is really the key to the treatment system and that's why maintaining a flow through a wetland system such that you're exposing the wastewater to many different types of um, microenvironments is, is the key. That's also one of the reasons why we planted um, many different species. Each species is going to grow its own uh, type of microorganisms, a biofilm on it. Some plants will actually put oxygen into the substrate more than others so all of those are going to influence the, the chemistry of the, of the uh, wastewater as it flows through.
I'm really happy with the water quality results that have come back. Uh, um, for a long time, these wetlands weren't really topped up with water. We simply couldn't get enough water. And uh, even though we've been pumping from the river, over a seven and a half hectare area of, of wetland surface area, you get a lot of evapotranspiration. You can get several hundred kilolitres per day. So even though we're topping it up, um, water's being lost from the system. So for most of its establishment period, it really didn't have much flowing water. During the last month, we've been putting pumps at the end of each wetland cell, recirculating them back through the system to start that flow. And that was the essential part of priming the, mm. the wetlands in order to be ready to receive effluent. Mm. And since we've been doing that, <clears throat> Nitrogen concentrations in the two major cells have dropped dramatically from somewhere in the vicinity of three milligrams per litre to well under one milligram per litre just through that recycling process. And that's much better than the natural water that you draw from the Logan River? Oh yeah, it's, it's very evident. Uh, you can see the water from the Logan River is quite turbid and uh, it comes out drinking water, turbidity. So if the wetland capacity was higher than the flows from the sewage, you could actually clean some river water as well. Absolutely. That's, that's what it's helped. been doing. This is the Logan River and it's considered to be a highly polluted river system. And that's largely because there's been um, a lot of clearing right down from the riparian areas. There's a lot of agriculture in this area and that can put a lot of nutrients and sediment and chemicals into the river. Really what the wetland system is about doing is protecting the river. So rather than putting, say, uh, treated effluent from the sewage treatment plant into straight into the river, putting it through a wetland will do a number of things. One of them is that it's going to do what they term as polish. Uh, the wastewater as it flows through, so it's going to reduce the, the pollutants in it. But more than that, it's actually going to add things into the wastewater stream. And two of the important things it'll add are microbes. So as it flows through here, it picks up environmental microbes rather than being just sterile effluent that flows out of a sewage treatment plant. It is also going to transform remaining nutrients into organically bound nutrients. And so instead of going out in the form of say nitrate or ammonium, it's gonna go out as say organically bound nitrogen or organically bound phosphorus. And that is a lot better for the river than if you're putting in say the nitrate and ammonium forms. In rivers and lakes, they have what they call offline wetland systems where you literally just pump water from the river, recirculate it through a wetland and then goes back into the river. Mm. And um, that's been used very successfully on fairly large scales in some parts of the world. I mean, the best thing to do in the first place is not destroy the riparian vegetation and not trash the rivers in the first place, but certainly reinstating wetlands and using them as their natural function of cleaning water is very appropriate and suitable and very effective. been a long journey this one right from the design and construction planting drought birds then we're pretty close to the end of the 12 month establishment stage and over the last couple of days it's received its first amount of effluent once all the ecosystem adjusts to the different water quality the plants are going to respond to it and I predict even during these winter months the plants are going to thicken up and there's nothing like a bit of effluent to keep a wetland plant happy. This one here is Leperonia and these ones I harvested from another wetland, the seeds, and grew them so they're like my little baby. They didn't grow very well in the beginning um, and we really didn't think they were going to make it. But uh, only been the last couple of months. Yeah, yeah, they were all spindly and not travelling at all and now look at them, they're just, they're just glowing, they're loving it. This, 
This one's Bulbachinus fluviatilis. And this one, we it's got these little bulbs at the base of them that you can grow plants from. And these ones we harvested from the casino constructed wetland, which was uh, very kind of Richmond Valley Council to let us use them. But this one's been a real soldier. You can see we put uh, an edge planting of it along because it's a very vigorous plant and it can compete with edge weeds. And um, this one's even moving right up onto the bank. It's, it's uh, quite spectacular. You can see it's browning off a bit. That's just what it naturally does during this time of the year. But it's still sending out shoots and still traveling a lot through the wetland. And it seems to coexist quite well with other wetland plants. It doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to compete so badly with um, plants. <coughs> and this one here, Cyperus exaltatus. That was one of the ones we, see we planted by seeds. And uh, just before we planted all the wetland plants, we hand distributed all of these cells with seeds. And we put in, worked out somewhere like 200 million wetland seeds. This was another seeding plant, which is Juncus. And in fact, looking out in this section of the wetland, Juncus is the dominant plant. And um, this was a real saviour doing the seeding because some of the wetland plants didn't establish well and these ones filled in the gaps but they don't compete with the wetland plants once they do start establishing. You can see over here we got Vormia, Vormia articulata and again this was a slow developer and we we're a little bit worried about this one but uh, it's just come on a, of its own just in the last couple of months really and just in the last few weeks it's started flowering for the first time so that's lovely when it gets to the flowering stage you know it's well and truly established Schoenoplectus and these ones aren't such spectacular examples because this these ones were didn't really get enough water in the earlier stages but this one is a real powerhouse of a constructed wetland and it's one of the most commonly used wetland plants. You can see they've got mature seeds here so I like to like to go around and disseminate these around the place. Hopefully they'll grow new babies. This is one of the rows of bulbachinus that didn't get destroyed by uh, birds and that's probably because it's more in the upstream part of the wetland where the water wasn't laying so much and the birds were attracted of course to the water and pretty much ate everything in its path so this is a nice vigorous stand of bulbachinus and uh, it's it's been traveling very effectively through the wetland so you can see it's spreading out amongst that schoenoplectus there and it's spreading out that direction so it'll definitely be one of the predominant plants at let's say in five years time you're going to get a bit of a, a lot of changing in the ecosystem in the plant community so this one I predict is going to be one of the dominant species this one's an interesting one in the upstream parts we didn't get much water in the during the drought period and we got a lot of weeds uh, this one was ragweed and we were quite worried about it we spent hours digging them out but as soon as we were able to fill the wetland cells up these keeled over and died so they can't tolerate waterlogging conditions and a lot of the earlier weeds that we did get in here when these were very young the wetland plants are no longer present in here simply because we've changed the hydrological conditions of the system. So more Cyperus. We've got a ring in here. That's Typha. And Typha grows naturally around in dams and wetlands around this area. And um, this probably got brought in by birds or possibly from river water. And it's established. Um, but we're quite happy to have Typha in this wetland. It's also a commonly used wetland plant and um, it's well known for 
treating water effectively. Thank goodness for David Pont insisting we sow cedars in it. In fact I reckon uh, I'd like to grow a wetland where it's grown entirely by seed sometime and just spray it onto the surface. About two and a half months for it to do the whole planting and there was total of from memory about 80,000 wetland plants put in initially and then we planted about another 20,000 uh, replanted areas that got damaged and um, and then we also were physically were digging plants out of the ground and relocating them in areas where plants weren't so well established So what we're doing is recycling water from one of the uphill wetlands. Um, that one's still got a little bit of nitrogen, so what we're doing is recycling it through this system, which is the largest wetland system, and um, with the aim of dropping the nitrogen out of the water. We know this, this cell here is working very effectively. So, while we've got that cell one is still just establishing uh, we're doing we're continuing to recycle that water this one's a, a sedge it's actually an introduced sedge and it's commonly called dirty dora and uh, or rice sedge and it's actually from Asia but it's become naturalized within the area now we didn't plant them we never put any seeds in them but this one come out nonetheless and we assume that that came from river water because it grows all around the, the river area um, and it actually ended up having a very beneficial effect because this one uh, was a very quick grower and it would tend to establish in areas where the other wetland plants hadn't established well yes but the one thing about it is that it's not very competitive so as soon as other wetland plants come out that's taller than it it can't compete so it filled in the gaps in the early stages and now it's mostly just on, on edges where there's not really a lot of competition so every plant's a good plant really in a wetland system and uh, yeah so it's a very welcome addition to this wetland Heaps of snails everywhere. The more macroinvertebrates in the system, the better, the better it is, ecologically and water quality wise. Yeah. <laughs>